Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for Thanks for showing up for this. Uh, I see we've got uh, 24 of us online now, and I know a lot more are coming. Um, really excited to be uh, welcoming my friend Matt to uh, be doing the main, uh, main presentation here. And he'll be on stage in about, uh, about 20 minutes or so after we've got through our welcome and overview. And uh, once Joseph gives us the, uh, the crash course and what's new in Power BI that uh, he's had all of uh, what a day to prepare for. So um, it was all good stuff. So as usual, I want to start off by, uh, by saying a big thanks to the sponsors, uh, Excel Guru uh, being my company um, that, uh, that organizes this and puts this together and hosts it and MCs it and all that kind of jazz. Uh, Skillwave is our training division. Our featured speaker tonight is uh, my, uh, one of my partners at Skillwave. Um, so, and we've got all kinds of awesome training there. If you're looking to really up your business intelligence game, this is a great place to go and get some awesome training on how to make everything better. Uh, Microsoft for, uh, for helping us out, providing the software, and uh, also a, a shout out to uh, the Monkey Tools add-in, which is uh, my software that I sell through, uh, through Excel Guru. Um, just wanted to, uh, to put a note out on that one specifically and remind folks, especially in the Power BI group, if you're building Power BI models and you ever need to get those models back to Excel, uh, we now actually support inside Monkey Tools the ability to import a data model from Excel back into Power BI so that you can actually do extra work there. So if you work like I do where you spend the majority of time in Excel, uh, this is a great tool to, uh, to get you there and, and help out with that. Uh, we do a ton of other stuff as well, but this is just one of the, uh, the newest and, and biggest features that we've uh, we've brought in recently that I think everybody should know about. Our next meetup that's coming up here, uh, we have a meetup in a couple of weeks in, in August. On August 5th, we've got Clive Saunders. He's a brand new speaker for us who uh, who popped something into our, uh, our speaker form and volunteered to do a presentation called Double Dating, Two Ways of Handling Inconsistent Date Formats. There is just so much wrapped in that title that is absolutely awesome that we had to say yes. Um, so uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing what's actually coming on that one. And then on August 19th, our next Power BI presentation, uh, we have Reed Havens is going to be coming to show us how to bedazzle your bookmarks and buttons inside Power BI. And if you haven't seen Reed's stuff, uh, he always does really cool stuff with, uh, with data visualization and presentation. So we're really looking forward to having Reed uh, join us uh, next month. Uh, the last uh, sort of thing I'm going to throw out there is that if you would like to speak here, if you uh, want to be our next Clive, um, please fill out this little form here at xlguru.ca slash speak at Vanpug. Tell us what you'd love to present about. We love having new speakers here. It's a great forum to uh, to come out and show the things that you're doing that you think are really cool and, and uh, be able to chat with people about it. Um, we'd love to hear from you. So fill out that survey. Uh, it gives us everything we need to know, and then we'll be in touch to get you on our stage as well. Um, Geez, you know, Joseph, I think I managed to wrap off uh, five minutes worth of, uh, of intro <laughs> slides in about two minutes. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to let you take over now and uh, and dive in because I think you got lots to talk about, don't you? I I do indeed. Uh, yeah, let me just pull it up. And, and off we go. Thanks, right. Ken. Fantastic. All right, man. It is all yours. Perfect. So... Well, welcome everybody uh, to Power BI monthly meetup group. Uh, I'm going to cover the what's new in Power BI for July of this year. Um, the the desktop release actually came out yesterday, as as Ken said earlier, and and that's pretty par for course for the desktop releases. They always seem to come out really close around our meetup group. So I'm actually glad that it was the day before and not the day after, because that always sort of gnaws at me a little bit. Um, but uh, just yeah, just before we get started, just a little bit about me. So uh, as I said before, my name is Joseph Yates, uh, and I am a senior financial analyst of business intelligence and data analysis at Corporate Finance Institute. So I use SQL Server, RStudio, and Power Query in Excel and Power BI uh, to model, manipulate, analyze, and visualize data. I have my website up on the slides here, feathersanalytics.com, where I blog about all things Power BI and R, uh, but really most importantly to me is how I can uh, create, curate, and communicate insights from data using these tools. Uh, I also have my Twitter and my LinkedIn profiles up there on the slides as well. Uh, so please feel free to connect if you have any questions from the session today, or just wanna talk about anything sort of data related analytics uh, love connecting to the wider community and, and hearing your thoughts and feedback. So please do connect um, in, in either way. So with that, why don't we jump into the material for today? Because as Ken said, we have a lot to cover. 
So as usual, I'm going to start with the Microsoft uh, feature release blog or feature summary blog that um, that they publish with every monthly update. So I'm not going to have a chance to cover every single um, of the new feature, unfortunately. Um, but if you are interested in learning a little bit more about what I will be covering, but also just some of the things that I may not have time to cover, uh, they're all available in this blog over here. So the uh, the, the structure of the blog is usually split into a reporting section up here at the top, any updates to do with data modeling uh, and data connectivity and so on. So all the new features are logically grouped together uh, and you can just sort of browse however you want. What One thing that has uh, I've actually missed and it looks like it's been going on for, for the last couple months uh, is on the Power Query website. There's a monthly Power Query blog now that summarizes just the Power Query updates from the most recent Power BI desktop release. So all of these updates, which are some new uh, and updated connectors in Power BI as it relates to Power Query, has its own dedicated blog page now on the Power Query website. You can also see these updates in the data connectivity section here. Um, but it does have its own dedicated blog. So just wanted to call that out because that's something that I'd missed uh, until pulling the session together for today. So my, uh, let's go back to the top. My first favorite update from this month is the um, update to conditional formatting in Power BI. So if I jump back into the report here, uh, and if I select this visual in the bottom left-hand corner, one thing that we've always uh, been able to do, or we have been able to do for a while, um, is you know we we can set like our our data colors, um, just hitting colors from a drop down, uh, and we can set our axes colors as well. But now we have the option to do this using this uh, formula button for conditional formatting. So if I click on this button here. We now have the option that instead of just defining a color from a drop down, we can choose to format by either a color scale, rules, or a field value based on one of the fields from the data model of our report. Uh, let me just click out of there, or if I select count of clients, for example. Uh, and then from here, we can select you know, what we want the minimum color to be, all the way up to the maximum color for using color scale. Um, I've not really had much chance to play around with this feature yet, but I, I think it's great that we have more control over things like um, the actual data labels within the visuals. So uh, within this visual here, where we have the 400,000, 406,000, 360, instead of just selecting one color for all labels, if we want to have that change color dynamically, we now have the ability to do that. Uh, and this conditional formatting functionality has also come to uh, total labels, legend text colors, axis titles and grid lines, uh, and, and a whole host of other things. Um, so really just giving more flexibility to the look and feel of visuals within the Power BI report. Uh, my next favorite feature from, from this month's release is the general availability of small multiples within Power BI uh, and some additional enhancements as well to this feature. Um, some came out in the June release as well. Um, uh, and then this month, both the general availability and uh, the ability to sort. So what small multiples is, uh, is if I click on this visual in the bottom left-hand corner, over here in the visualizations pane, we have this small multiples well. Uh, and essentially what that allows us to do is have another dimension or another column from our data set to slice and dice our data by. In this column chart, we have our account product on the axes. So we can see that for all the distinct account products, we have a unique column in our column chart. We're also slicing by our legend. So the color, we can see that deposit and investments are both have the product category of deposit, loans and credit card are both, borrowing, are both borrowing. So right now we are sort of slicing our data by two different dimensions and small multiples allows us to layer on another uh, column to slice our data even further. So from our client dimension, I'm gonna grab client type and drop that onto the small multiple here. And if I make this a bit bigger, we can see that now instead of one column chart, 
it essentially splits that into four uh, across our four different client types of golden, regular, youth, and young adult. We have the same visual uh, and the y-axes are the same across them. So we can still do a little bit of a comparison, but we can now see the same breakdown of product category and account product, but by client type as well. Uh, and what we can do now is typically when we sort our column charts, we can sort our axes. So if we want to sort account product descending, this sorts um, each of the column charts alphabetically. Or, uh, and actually let's do that in ascending alphabetically here. So we have credit card starts with a C to the very left, deposit insurance investments, and then loans. So that's sorted alphabetically by the name of our columns. But what we can do now is also sort by our small multiples. So we can choose the client type, which is how we're, we've broken down our visual into the four different sections. And then that, that now orders it alphabetically. So G for golden, then regular, young adult, and youth. But we can also sort it by the measure that's populating the values part of our column chart. So count of clients here. And if I sort that in descending instead, now we have the, the small multiple that has the, the most um, count of clients, so the highest amount in our DAX measure sorted all the way to the lowest. So this new functionality allows us to, again, really further customize our visual and have the display exactly um, how we want to have that look and feel in our report. I'll just go back here. Uh, my, my next favorite feature update has been sort of building on a recent trend of Power BI that we're starting to see a, more of a seamless integration of Power BI with other applications within the Power Platform, uh, as well as paginated reports. So I know that last month, having, having watched the recording, Yana covered the Microsoft Team integration as well and how Power BI more seem, more inter, or integrates more seamlessly uh, with Microsoft Teams. But now we can do this uh, with actual visuals within Power BI. So we have a paginated report visual, which is currently in preview. And if I change the visual type to that, once it updates, we can now connect to a, a, connect to a report that's in our workspace. So I'm, I'm logged into my personal account in Power BI. If I want to pull in one of the paginated reports that I've published, that can now just be a report visual within my Power BI report. Uh, I have none published to my workspace, so I have none um, listed right here. But if I had had one published, we could just select it and it would appear in our report as a visual. For a little while now, we've had a Power Apps visual that's available to integrate into our Power BI report. Uh, so we can either choose an existing Power App that we have published, or we can choose to create a new one directly in Power BI. So if I go to um, create new, it pops up this warning, do we want to open browser? And that would take us into the Power App Studio to, to design and then publish our app, which um, don't have time to go through that entire process today. But, but again, just another application within the Power Platform you can access um, right from within Power BI. The new visual from this month has the Power Automate for Power BI. And Again, just natively within Power BI, we can now either create a button that triggers an automated task right from within the report itself. Uh, so the first step is to add data um, into the field well, which we can see over here. So I've dragged in account product, product category, client type, and then the count of clients. And then to set up our, our new Power Automate flow, I can hit the ellipsis in the top right-hand corner of the visual and select Edit. Uh, and once it has a bit of time to think, it pops up the instructions. It says that I don't have any flows published to my workspace, but I can actually either use some templates or create one from scratch if, um, if I want to do that. There's a really helpful blog post, trigger a cloud flow from any Power BI report. It was published uh, late last week, and it goes through step-by-step step of how we can either 
create, publish, and then connect to a Power Automate flow or build it directly from within our Power BI report uh, and some of the cool things that this feature allows us to do as well. Uh, let's just pop back into Power BI here. Uh, the, the next update is the new model view is now generally available. Uh, I've covered this feature previously um, as, as it was in preview. Uh, and really, it's just an update to the user interface and, in, and allows for an improved user experience within this model view in the Power BI report. So the, the labeling of the dimensions, the icons and the dimensions, and the relationships between them um, are a lot more clear, more intuitive. Uh, and now this is going to be the experience for all the reports is going to be updated um, to this view. So I'm really happy with that. Uh, if I just go back into the blog post here and go to the streaming data flow. So uh, I haven't been able to pull together a demo for this just yet, um, but one feature that I think is really cool, really looking forward to getting um, my hands into is the streaming data flows for Power BI is now in preview. Uh, so essentially what this will allow us to do is work with streaming data with the same no code drag and drop interface and experience that we're used to with batch data today in Power BI. Uh, so we can connect to streaming data in Azure, uh, in the IoT hub or the event hub, and all the data visualization capabilities will work with streaming data, as I said, as they do with our batch data from our data warehouse or flat files or wherever we get data from today. Uh, how Okay, so I still have a few minutes, and I just want to call out my favorite update from June uh, of 2021, so last month's update, uh, and it's the Q&A improvement for inferred results. So if I go back into my Power BI report, one thing that we can do with the natural language query uh, is we just type in a question about our data, uh, and a visual is created for us. So in this example, I've typed in, what is the current balance by account product? Uh, but if I made a mistake, or if I said by account product and use a different shorthand um, than that the AI visual couldn't understand, it does give us some, some suggestions below here. So if I click on the suggestion here, the word that it does not understand from my natural language query is now underlined with the double uh, double red underline here. But the, what the enhancement now has is this dialogue underneath that although this is what's typed in to um, the top of the visual here, we're actually showing the results for balance by account product. So this just this is a, a um, Small, small enhancement. Um, you know, doesn't hugely change the functionality of the visual, but it makes for a lot clearer user experience. And now we can see exactly what the visual relates to. Um, it, it's it's a lot more explicit in what we're actually showing the results for. Uh, and I think this is really similar to what you, what we would see and what you would see uh, in your favorite search engine. If you type the wrong thing in, results still come up but there is that little note at the top saying, actually, we're, sh we're showing results for this thing. And I think with that, I'm going to just pop back into the slides here, um, try to cover as many of my favorites from July and even sort of a little bonus one from June in there as well. Um, but you know, with that, I think that's, that's my time. My website's up there, Feathers Analytics. My social handles are up there as well. Um, if you want to connect, if you have any questions um, about any of the feature releases or really anything with Power BI, really happy to connect. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the feature presentation for tonight. So I think with that, I'm going to throw it back to Ken and Matt. So thank awesome. you very much. Thanks, Joseph. Um, and yeah, now uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, to welcome my good friend Matt Allington to our uh, platform here. Um, you know, do I really even need to give you an introduction, Matt? I mean, I think everybody knows who you are. Right. Really? So, <laughs> uh, for, was, for those uh, who, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. 
for uh, for those who uh, who haven't run into Matt, um, I've known Matt for a long time, and uh, when I want to learn something about Dax, Matt is the is the guy that I go to. Uh, he's he's the one that helps me out and and whatnot. Um, I'm really uh, really pleased to be able to call him one of my partners at the Skillway uh, Training Platform as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on our platform, Matt. And I'm gonna. Uh, I'm just going to basically sort of throw out the thing here that's to say that Matt and I have talked beforehand. I know he's going to do some demos today. Uh, I'm going to emcee the questions in between demos uh, and whatnot. But um, outside of that, Matt, I'm going to step out of your way and, and let you take over the floor and do what you do best. Okay. I just have to, first things first, I have to get the dog off my lap. Um, it's a bit like getting the monkey off your back, isn't it? But she just has a way of coming in on my into my office when I when I need to do a demo. So thanks, Ken. Thanks for the invitation uh, to be part of the session today. And uh, and so I'm going to be talking about this concept of thinking about DAX functions differently. Now I'm saying this is an intermediate DAX session. Um, different people have different views about what's beginners, what's intermediate, what's um, advanced, and so on. And I've taught lots of people DAX. And in my experience, people who have started the DAX journey don't always have a clear understanding of the fundamentals. And, and I like people to get some experience. And then I like to spend time with them going back over the fundamentals to make sure that they have everything clear in their head. And, and in my experience, once people understand these concepts uh, well, that is a great platform for growth and for learning and getting into more advanced concepts. So, so with that's the sort of background for today and, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about to try and give you some of those fundamentals. Um, I will briefly introduce myself. Um, I have spoken at the user group in Vancouver before, I think, uh, do you, Ken, no, 2016 or something, 2017, I was up there. Um, so, but my background, I. I've worked at Coca-Cola for most of my life, and I had the privilege of working in IT and business. And that's actually one of the reasons that I actually um, assign some of my success is because I've I've been on both sides of the of the fence. I now do a consulting um, business from Sydney, mainly training, but also consulting with people around the world. I will make these slides available, so I won't sort of go into a lot of detail. Um, this is my book, Supercharged Power BI. Um, we're in the third edition now. Uh, it's going very well around the world. And, and as Ken mentioned, uh, he and I are uh, two of the partners in uh, Skillwave. So as far as the agenda for this session, so I will do just a brief intro, and then I'm going to do some demos. And the first demo is I'm going to just, just take a simple step through the three different ways that you can write DAX. And then I'm going to apply some of those learnings and these new thinking styles to help you um, understand what you're doing when you're writing some more complex formulas. And hopefully that'll be uh, a good experience for you. So let's talk about this basic intro. So DAX is a functional language. Now, what I mean by that is uh, a function is like a black box. You you take the function, you pass some parameters to the function, and the function gives you a result. So, you know, that's what we mean when we say it's a functional language. So this is different to, say, SQL or T-SQL, which is a scripting language. Um, and so, so the first thing, DAX is a functional language, and it has its roots coming from Excel. So Excel is also a functional language. And this is one of the decisions that Microsoft made very early on was to try and make this DAX language accessible to people coming from an Excel background. Uh, so that's fabulous for people like me and maybe people like you that have, if you have had a, a strong Excel background. So DAX is the language of this product, SQL Server Analysis Services Tabular. Um, this is a database tool, which is a very important point that many Excel people struggle with as they migrate from Excel to Power BI. So Power BI has a tabular database engine under the hood. And one of the great things about this is that engine exists inside Power BI. It exists inside Power Pivot for Excel. It also exists inside SQL Server Analysis Services Tabular. And so once you learn the skills of DAX and data modeling using the tabular engine, you can apply them in many different ways across 
many different products. Now, the first thing that I'm going to cover is that you need to be clear that DAX can generate three different types of output. It can generate a single value or a column or a table. It's the same language, it's the same functional language, but depending on how you apply it, you will get a different outcome. And, and so that's the first set of demos that I want to talk to you about, which is these three different ways of writing DAX. Um, I'm not sure if you recognize these items on the screen. These are unit blocks. Um, I'm showing my age. I'm sure that when I was at school, primary school, we used to have these unit blocks. And, um, and it occurred to me that the DAX language is very similar to these unit blocks. And so when you write a DAX measure, you get a single value. And that's analogous to one of these single unit blocks. It's a single number that you can use uh, inside your tool, your model. The second way you can write DAX is a calculated column. And when you write DAX as a calculated column, you actually get a column of data, which is like, um, like the tens block in these unit block uh, tables. And then the third way you can write a DAX formula is a table where you have multiple columns inside um, a greater object. And then ultimately you end up with the cube, which is the which is the combination of, of many tables. So with that in mind, I'm just going to jump over to AdventureWorks and I'm going to write all three of those types of DAX formulas. Nothing super complex. I just want to lay the foundation so that everyone's crystal clear on what I'm talking about here. So I'm using um, my AdventureWorks data model. This is a simplified version of AdventureWorks. It's a star schema. Um, one of the best tips for learning Power BI is you should always try and build a star schema like this. That's a huge topic in its own right. And uh, this is a simplified version. And also I've updated VentureWorks for it to be for 2020 um, as opposed to the older version, which was 2004. Now in my sales table, I've got a column, which is the extended amount, which is basically the dollar values for the transactions. And so if I come over here to the sales table, Here's the extended amount column. And every row in this particular column is the value of a transaction or a line level within an invoice. And in fact, if you look down here, you'll see that there's actually 60,000 different rows in this table. And when I'm in the extended amount column, there's therefore 60,000 different numbers, which together will add up to the total value of my sales. And so I can come, and this is just a card. A card is a visual that allows me to display a single number. And if I drag that column into the card, I get the total of that column of numbers. All those 60,000 numbers have been added together. And this is what we call an implicit measure. And by that, what I mean is that when you take the column of numbers and you drag it and drop it here into this card, Power BI automatically takes those numbers and adds them up for you. It does that implicitly without you having to specify the need to do that. So this is why we call it an implicit measure. But one of the key points about this first demo is that what you have to understand is that there are many numbers coming from the column, but this implicit measure returns a single value. It's not returning all of the numbers, it's returning a single value. And so we call this an implicit measure. Now, you can use implicit measures, but it's much better to write your own measures. And so I'm going to write a new measure in the sales table, and I'll call this total sales. And I can use the functional language that I mentioned before. I can sum up the extended amount column. And there are many benefits of writing measures way beyond the scope of what I can cover here. But one of the benefits is I can give it some permanent formatting so that I can use it over and over again. I can give it a much better name, like total sales is a better name than extended amount. And I'm now going to add a new visual. This time it's a table visual. Don't confuse the table visual with a table in the data model, two completely different things. So I'm going to bring product category into my table visual, and I'm going to bring total sales into my table visual. 
And now notice that I'm getting four separate numbers. But importantly, this is still a measure and a measure still delivers a single result. So when you look at this table visual, you should be clear that this is a measure returning a single value, but it's doing it four times, once, twice, three, four. The reason it's doing it four times is because the table visual is asking the engine to go and execute this measure four times. So a measure always returns a single value, but the table visual in this case is telling Power BI to execute that measure four times. Indeed, if I turned it into a column chart, the column chart is telling the database to execute, in this case, the measure three times. As indeed, if I turned it into a pie chart, the pie chart visual is telling Power BI to execute the measure three times. Okay, so hopefully enough of that, a measure always returns a single value. So the second way you can write a DAX formula is as a calculated column. And so here I am in the sales table and I've got an extended amount column and I've also got a tax amount column, but I don't have a column that tells me the total sales including tax but I could create that column if I choose to. So I could come up here, right click, do a new column. I'm going to call this total sales, including tax. I'm gonna call it column because I'll use this later on. And that will just be take the value in the extended amount column and add it to the value in the tax amount column. Now, the point I want you to take away from this piece of the demo. I have written one formula, one DAX formula, but unlike the measure, it doesn't return a single result. It returns many results. This time, it's returning one result for every single row in my table, the table where I'm placing my calculated column. So it's the same DAX language, but it's not returning a single value, it's returning multiple values. And the way this works, of course, is that we have two columns. We have the extended amount column and we have the tax amount column. And the formula gets evaluated for every single row in the table. So when I pick a single row in my table, at that point in time, there's only a single value in my extended amount column and there's only a single value in my tax amount column. And therefore, I can get a single result, in this case, 3,864. And, so, um, and so the point about a calculated column is it's one DAX formula. The DAX formula is executed multiple times, once for every row in the table, and the DAX formula returns many values in the form of a column of multiple values. Sorry, my dog needing more attention. All right, so that's the second way that you can write a DAX formula. The first way returns a single value. The second way returns a column of values. The third way is to use DAX as a query language. And I'm going to use an external tool, which I have installed, DAX Studio. I've got lots of articles about DAX Studio on my website, if you're interested. And this is more advanced. I, I don't want to go into the detail. I just want to show you that it is possible to write a DAX formula and generate a table of data. And so in this case, I'm going to use a function called summarize. And I'm going to summarize the sales table. And I want to see all of the product categories that exist within the sales transactions that I have. And so if I run this query, notice that I actually get a table generated. Now at the moment, my table only has a single column in it. So it's a single column table. That is completely different to what I did over here. This is a new column that has been inserted in an existing table. What I've just done here is I've generated a brand new table containing a single column. This is a different concept. 
And also notice that there's only three values in this category table. There are four different categories that exist inside this product category column, but only three of them have sales. And because I'm summarizing the sales table, it actually doesn't show me the fourth product, which is components, because they don't exist inside the sales table. Therefore, this DAX query excludes them. And now that I've done that, I can continue to build out my DAX query to generate something different. So I'm going to add another column to my brand new table, and I'm going to call it Total Sales. Put any name I want, and I'm going to use the Total Sales measure. I hope I'm going to use the total sales measure to populate that new column. And so when I run this, notice now that I've got a brand new table containing the product categories and the total sales for those categories. And I've done this in an external tool called DAX Studio. But I can also do this inside Power BI. So I'm going to copy this, this DAX query Control C. I'm going to jump over here to my Power BI desktop file and I'm going to click on the new table button. And without using the evaluate statement, I'm going to paste that DAX query. And now notice that I have my new table, which has been materialized inside my data model. So if I jump over here, here is the brand new table. Do not confuse this brand new table with this one that I showed you before. These are two completely different things. This one is a visual which is sending a request to the measure and asking that measure to be evaluated four times and to display that visual on your report. That is completely different to this one, which is a DAX query which is telling the database to materialize a brand new table and insert that as part of your data model. Two completely different things. All right, so let me jump back over here and just summarize that and then I'll pause to see if there's any questions. So, so you can write the one DAX language three different ways to get different outcomes. So you write a measure, a measure always returns a single value that measure can be used in a visual, and it's the visual that repeats the execution of the measure. The second way is a column, so you always get multiple values, and a column is always inserted inside an existing table. And then the third way is you can write a DAX query, which actually physically generates a brand new table that doesn't exist inside your model, and you can permanently store it in your model. And as I said, don't confuse the table visual with a materialized table using the DAX language. So I'm going to take a pause and just see if there's any questions at this point, Ken. Yeah, Matt, we've got a few of them here. Um, I know some people are having some video issues. Uh, hopefully those, um, I don't think it's anything to do with our side, unfortunately, but hopefully uh, they will resolve for you. Um, one question that came in, uh, as far as your implicit measures, Matt, there's no way to be able to get through the user interface to actually see the DAX that the implicit measure is created. Is that correct? Definitely not. If you're using Power Pivot for Excel and then you migrate your Power Pivot for Excel workbook into Power BI, ironically, it does generate the, the code that supports that implicit measure. But no, there's no way of doing that. However, what you can do is, unfortunately, I, don't, I think Microsoft should enhance this. But if I right click and do a new quick measure, this is basically a wizard based tool and I could do a calculation such as um, and unfortunately there's no simple one, but I could do addition and I could come here and I could say my base measure is the extended amount and my second measure say is freight and I click OK and that the difference between a quick measure and an implicit measure is that the quick measure actually generates the DAX code under the hood. And I did speak to Will Thompson about this, and, and I said to him, I, I really believe that quick measures should be able to generate the implicit measures, and he wasn't a big fan. So um, if you think funny, that's a good I, idea. I, I told him exactly the same thing. I said the basic ones need to be there, and yeah, I got the same response. Yeah. He wasn't a fan, yeah. so yeah, um, okay. yeah shame. Uh, okay, next question. Um, can you use DAX Studio to create a table in Power Pivot? 
Yes, you can. Um, longer story, I do have a blog article. Um, so maybe, um, so let me just quickly, if you go to my website, so shortcut for my website is xbi.com.au. That will take you to my website. If you search on my website for Excel table, Excel table, pretty sure this, is, this should find it. So nothing like DAX query tables in Excel 2010. I reckon this one will do it. I've got a couple of articles, but this one here, DAX query tables in Excel 2010 from, I mean, this is old, right? This is 2015, I wrote this. And so basically, if you go through this, it'll teach you how to, to write a DAX query and insert it in your Power Pivot data model so that it's a table, not a pivot table. There's a couple of other articles that cover that as well. You just have to browse uh, on that. Uh, this one here, I think, is another is another good way to learn how to do it. All right, cool. Uh, we do have a comment that says maybe you can use Performance Analyzer. Um, I think it's a win to say that you can see the code. Uh, I mean, Paul, to be honest with you, I mean, if you, uh, if you happen to have monkey tools, uh, you can also connect to a Power BI model, and I tell you exactly what the formula is for all of the implicit measures as well. So you can't extract them, it's just through the Power, um, Power BI user interface. That very, not it's a very good point. If I did, um, if I sort of turn this into an, but I don't really have an implicit measure. Yeah, you'd have to use performance yeah. analyzer, maybe not. Okay, yep, sorry. Um, let me see, uh, the table that you created with your DAX formula, how does it get updated with new data? Does it require a refresh or does it do it automatically? No, it definitely requires a refresh. So uh, calculated columns and calculated tables, so effectively uh, when you click on new table, it's a calculated table, they only get updated during refresh. They will not respond to slices or any other cross-filtering behavior from a refresh perspective. They will definitely get filtered by slices, but they won't recalculate unless you trigger a refresh. Right. I believe- Now also, sorry, just if I could just add one more, sorry, it sounds like it might be done anyway, Ken, but. Remember, I'm laying the foundations down here to show you what's happening under the hood. What I'm going to do next is I want to take that understanding and help you understand how to do uh, a lot of what I just showed you without having to materialize these tables. Uh, you got one final question on this one, Matt, and I think we're good to uh, to go. Uh, is there any blog on how to get the AdventureWorks 2020 data sets from the web then, uh, then how to use them as a local SQL server? Uh, not an IT guy, so I need to learn it step by step. I, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Adventure 2020, I think Microsoft did create an AdventureWorks 2020 as well, but that's different to the one that I created. So basically, mine is already a star schema. I basically hacked away everything that I didn't care about, and, and then all I did was add 15 years or 16 years to the database. Um, so no, I, I don't know. There's a lot of good free stuff on the internet about how to um, learn SQL and install it. I taught myself going back um, seven years ago now, and so there's lots of good stuff out there. Just just go to YouTube, frankly, and, and Google, um, you know, how to learn SQL Server. Awesome. I think that's it for now. On to the next okay. question. All right, excellent. I didn't ask how much time we've got, but it's sort of a standard size um, demo, so I, I think I'll be fine. You've got as much time as you need, Matt. Um, we're, oh. we're here until you're done. What's the time there? It's quarter to seven at uh, in Vancouver. So, all right. So, look, I'm I'm probably halfway through. So, um, you know, I won't sort of hold you up too much. All right. So now that I've laid down that concept, I want to talk about the SUMX function, and I'm going to create a parallel between um, a calculated column and the SUMX function. So, SUMX is one of those Enigma functions that people perhaps don't really understand. But what I'm going to show you is that SUMX is just like a calculated column, but better. So let me give you a demo and then hopefully it will make some sense to you. So I'm going to jump over here. Let's start off with a calculated column. So I go to the sales table and remember this column that I created before using a DAX formula. And I wrote a single DAX formula as a calculated column, and that formula was evaluated many times, and it permanently stored 
each of those numbers in the new column in the table that I inserted it in. So that's how a calculated column works. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this formula, control C, and I'm going to create a new measure. So remember the difference, measure must return a single value. Calculated column is allowed to return multiple values and store them for later use. So if I paste this and change the name, so this is the measure version, notice that immediately I get an error. And this is because a measure does not have that same capability to permanently store those interim line by line results. A, a calculated column is a two dimensional object. Sorry, get my dog off me. So a calculated column is a two dimensional object. It's got a placeholder to store those numbers down the column. You cannot do that with a measure. A measure is expecting a single value. You can't get it to store these numbers like a calculated column does. And if you think about it, this, this is a column of data. The extended amount column has 60,000 values. If you, were to, if you were to print it on a printer, it's a two-dimensional object. It's got one column with 60,000 rows. And so what this formula is saying as a measure, is it says take this two-dimensional column and add it to this other two-dimensional column. And a measure, um, a base measure, cannot do that. If you want to write this as a measure, you have to do something like this. You've got to, first of all, add up all the numbers in that first column, and then add up all the numbers. I don't know why that IntelliSense is not working. I'm pretty, sometimes the IntelliSense lags a little bit. So what I'm now saying is I'm saying, go and add up all the numbers in the first column, go and add up all the numbers in the second column, and then when you get those two numbers, add them together. And of course, if I do that, it will return a single value, which is the requirement for a measure. So if I bring my these two columns in, the total sales, including tax column and measure, they both return the identical result, but they do it differently. This one permanently stores the answers in the column for later use. This one, first of all, adds up all the numbers um, in those two source columns and then adds them together. So different way of solving the same problem. But that wasn't the topic. The topic was sum x. And so let me show you, um, I'll, I'll just delete this, it's probably easier. So the sum x function is just like a calculated column. So when I write sum x, the first parameter it asks for is the name of the table. Now you don't get asked the name of the table when you're doing a calculated column, but you don't need to be asked because I'm putting the calculated column in the table. So there's no need for the DAX language to ask which table do you want me to put it in because I'm physically putting it inside the table. But with the sum X function, because it's a measure, you do have to tell it which table. So I want you to put this in the sales table. And then what's the DAX formula? Well, the formula is take the single, whoop, it's the extended amount column added to the tax amount column. And if you look at, if I hit OK now, the, the answer is the same. No change in the answer. And note that this part of the formula is identical to what I wrote inside that calculated column. And so in this sense, a sum X is identical to a calculated column. The syntax is slightly different. You have to provide the name of the function. You have to tell the function which table do you want to add this sort of pseudo calculated column to, and then you give it exactly the same formula. And the reason I'm telling you this is that if you think about sum X as being a calculated column, it gives you an opportunity to understand what's going on because you can always write that formula as a calculated column first. Any sum X formula can be written as a calculated column. So if you're not sure what you're trying to do, come in here, write the calculated column. The benefit is that you get to see the materialized list of values so that you can get your head around what that formula is doing and feel comfortable that it's doing what you want. Then you can copy that piece of code, which is the DAX formula, 
and you can insert it inside a sum x function and end up with the same result. And the benefit of the sum x function is that it doesn't permanently store those interim results in the calculated column. It works just like a calculated column without permanently storing those numbers in the, in the table. So, um, so in summary, so a calculated column, it works row by row and it permanently stores the results in the column. And you don't have to specify the name because you're physically putting that column into the table. Sum X is identical, but you can think of sum X as being like a invisible virtual column. It's created in memory under the hood. It creates those interim results, but it doesn't permanently store them. And so um, you can you can use this knowledge to visualize what you're doing in a calculated column first, if you like. Um, you have to specify the table name as the first parameter, otherwise it it won't know what you're trying to do. But the end result in this case, if it's a sum x, the end result is a sum. So it's going to add up all of those values that were in the column. But it's exactly the same with average x or min x or max x. You're still generating this virtual column, but instead of adding up the numbers at the end, you're just averaging the numbers or finding the biggest one or, or whatever. So, um, so it's a good way to think of that, that particular class of functions, which we call the x functions. Ken, I'll jump back over and see if there's any the questions. Questions are coming in hot and heavy all of a sudden here. So uh, Henry wants to know, can you sum across two tables with sum x? Oh, good question. Um, yes, you can, but it's more complex. So you may have you may have heard of the related function. So let me let me give you a quick demo here, and I'll do it as a calculated column because remember the whole concept of a calculated column is if I could do it as a column, I could do it as a um, a sum x. So the answer is the same. Now in the products table, I have a column called standard cost. Okay. So I'm just going to make something up. I'm going to add a new column, new calculated column in my sales table. And this is going to be the, I'll take the, uh, the total product cost, which is a column in the sales table. And I want to subtract the standard cost, which is in the products table, right? So if I try and say standard, well, that's the one in the sales table. That's not what I want to do. So you have to use the related function. And what the related function says is go from the many side of the relationship up to the one side of the relationship, find the column that I need and bring it back and use it in my calculated column. So this would be the standard product standard cost. And so in sense, because I can write this as a calculated column, and in fact, it looks like the standard cost is the cost that we've got in this sales table. But the point is, yes, you can. And because I can do it as a calculated column, I could do that inside a sum X. But there's a lot more to this because this there are more efficient and less efficient ways of writing sum X. That's a huge topic in its own right. But the short answer is yes. As long as there's a relationship, a many to one relationship. Cool. All right. Uh, next question for you is, uh, is using sum X better than using calculated columns from a performance perspective? Short answer, yes. Now, the longer answer is it depends, but the short answer is yes. And it's, and it's counterintuitive, particularly if you come from a SQL background. Most people with a SQL background are used to materializing the interim results so that they're available for rapid access at runtime. But in the DAX language and in Power BI, that's not normally the case. You're normally better off to do the calculations in memory at runtime than you are to store those values permanently. And you also have to understand that this is just one calculated column. What if I want to do total sales plus tax, uh, sorry, total, total sales plus freight? And what if I want to get total margin, which is extended amount minus cost? And before you know it, you've got 50 of these calculated columns and your workbook's gone from 2 meg to 20 meg, that's when the performance will really start to degrade. And so that's why you're better off, generally speaking, to do a sum X than a calculated column. Um, awesome. I think that's actually it. Uh, the okay. other one that came in was Ron answering, and he pretty much gave the same answer as you, but I was curious to hear your take on it. So there you go. Okay. Uh, so okay. I think you're, you're free to move on. 
All right, great. Um, all right, so the third one, um, so I've got two more demos to go, I think. So, so this time I'm going to talk about the filter function. And I want you to think about the filter function as it's like a virtual table with a new virtual column. All right, so that I'm laying the platform here. I'm going to explain it to you, of course, in a second. But if you start to think about filter like this, everything becomes easier to understand. So let me give you a demo. I'm going to come back into my model and I'll create a new table. And I'm going to bring my customer occupation into my table. So they're all the different customer occupations. And I want to know how many customers do I have within each occupation. So normally I would write a measure, but I'm just going to drag the customer key and do an implicit measure and I'll count the customer keys. Because the customer key is a primary key, counting those will give me the distinct number of customers. So 18,484 customers. Okay, I'm now going to write a more complex formula. I want to know how many large customers do I have? This is how many customers I have. I want to know how many large customers do I have. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it as a calculated column and a table first. And then I'm going to come back and write it as a more complex formula. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to go to my customers table. And remember, I said that um, a filter function is like a virtual calculated column. So I'm going to go to the customers table and I'm going to add a new calculated column. And this is going to, I'll just, I'll just call it column. And I'm just going to add the total sales measure. Now, when I read a new calculated column in the customers table using the total sales measure, it tells me the total sales for each customer. So this first customer, 8,200, second customer, 8,200. These ones are small, $200, 200, 41, 63, and so on. So there's a lot happening under the hood here, way beyond the scope of this session. But in its simplest form, when you write a calculated column like that using a measure, you get to see the total sales for that customer. OK, step one. Step two, I can now turn this column into a true-false column. So what I can do is I can say total sales greater than or equal to 2,000. Now, when I do that, it still evaluates the total sales for the customer, but it compares it to see whether it's greater than 2,000 or not. And if it is, it returns true. So remember, those first two customers were 8,000. And if it's not, it returns false. So those next few customers were quite small. So I've created a brand new true-false calculated column in my customers table. I first of all worked out what was the total sales, compared it against 2,000, and decided which ones were large and which ones were not large. So now I've got this calculated column. I can use it to my advantage. I can come here and I can filter using this brand new column I created and I'll just say keep the true ones. And when I do that, you'll see that I get 5,920 filtered rows. Or in other words, there are 5,920 customers in my database that are large. And the definition of large is greater than or equal to $2,000. So at least conceptually, you should understand that I have added a calculated column into my physical customers table, and I've used that to filter the customers table. OK, step one. So step two is I can actually write a filter function to do exactly that. So I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to do a new table. And my new table is going to be called large customers. And my large customers table is going to be the filter function. And exactly the same way as I showed you the sum x is like a calculated column, the filter is also like a calculated column. The difference is this function will return a table as the final result. The filter function returns a, a table as a result of the calculation. So I'm going to filter the customer's table. And I'm going to manually add a new calculated column that looks like this, total sales are greater than or equal to 2,000. 
The reason I did it first as a physical calculated column was so that you could see what it's doing. Hopefully you understand that I'm actually um, rebuilding that same construct. And when I write that as a new table function, now I end up with, oops, the wrong button. I end up with 5,220. So here it is again. My brand new table has 5,220 rows. And if I jump back here to my model, here is my new table. I have physically generated a brand new table using the filter function, and I've materialized it as part of my model. Now that I've done that, I can use this new table in my model. So I can join my customer key to the customer key because it's the same key. Um, this is bad because it created a one-to-one -one relationship. It really needs to be a one-to-many relationship. So the large customers is one-to-many. So I'm going to build that into my model. And so now I've got this table as part of my model. I can use that to solve my problem. So let me come back here. And here's my measure now. I'm going to write a new, I'll put it in the customers table. I'm going to do a new measure. And this will be total large customers. And I'm going to start to manipulate filtering behavior now. So I need to use calculate. So calculate, what do I want to calculate? Well, ultimately I want to count how many customers are there in the customers table. So it's going to be count rows of the customers table. But before I do that, I want to use this brand new table that I created to filter my model. So I can just say, use the large customers table as a filter. Notice what I've done. I've added the brand new table as the filter parameter inside my calculator function. So click OK. And I'll start down here. And there's the 5,920. And what I've done is I use the filter function to materialize this table. And then I, I created a relationship. I made a one to many relationship and then I use that inside my function. So that's physically what happens when you write a um, the filter function. You're basically generating this copy of the customer's table with a subset of the rows. But of course, exactly like calculated columns, if I did this every single time I wanted to apply a new filter, my model would blow up. I would have all of these all of these new tables that I didn't want to necessarily keep inside my model. So instead, I can copy that formula. And instead of materializing, I can actually use that as a virtual table. So this, of course, is going to give me exactly the same results. So what I'm doing is I'm saying calculate count rows of the customer's table. But before I do that, take a copy of the customer's table create a new virtual calculated column inside that copy of the customers table, put a filter on that new calculated column and only keep the customers that have sales greater than 2000, then take that virtual copy or, the, or sorry, that virtual table that I've generated and use that as a filter in my model. And the reason that it works is because when you generate a filter function, you get this relationship bundled in for free. This is what we call lineage. So not only does filter generate that table in memory, it also generates that relationship in memory. And that's why it works. And I think that's what I meant to talk about. So, so when you write um, filter, the table is not materialized. You get the virtual table, you get the virtual calculated column, you get the filter applied, you get the lineage that comes from the one-to-many relationship. It all happens automatically in the back end without you having to materialize the table. And it's much better than physically materializing the table because of course you can write as many different permutations of this inside your measures as you like, and you won't increase the size of your model at all. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there, Kim. All right, uh, so I'm going to go with the last question first here. So uh, Ron was asking why uh, why did you change the uh, the one to one relationship to the one to many uh, from for the uh, large to customer there? He said that it seems that to him that the relationship was set up as one to one. Should, isn't that the way it should have been? 
Um, it's a very good question um, with a not such a straight answer. The reason I did it, so the simple answer, the reason I did it is because when you use filter as a virtual function inside the DAX language, you get lineage and the type of lineage you get is a one to many relationship between the new virtual table and the source table. So that's the that's the reason I did it that way. Now, in this case, could I have left it as a one to one? Well, yes, I could have. I mean, if I delete that now um, and just oh, didn't mean to do that. I don't. All right. If I was to do it again, it would give me a one to one relationship. But as you probably know, the one to one relationships um, will have a bidirectional filter. And when you use the filter function inside a calculate, inside a measure, you definitely do not get that bidirectional filtering behavior. You get the, the one-to-many filtering behavior. And so, so that's, the, that's the answer. Do you have a, a brief description of the term lineage? Uh, that's a, a new concept for, uh, or a new term yes. for some, some folks as well. Um, I have it in my, uh, just let me quick, let me see if I can quickly. Uh, find a slide it won't take me a second so i just open up I, I do have a slide here i don't use lineage let me go to the next one next one next one here it is here's my definition of lineage it's the lineal descent from an ancestor so i got this out of I don't know, Wikipedia or something like that. And so if you think about um, your heritage, your, your bloodline within your family, that's what the word lineage means. It means where did I come from? And so in this sense, they're using that term lineage to say that I've generated this new virtual table, think of it as a child, and its parents, the lineage, comes from wherever it was sourced from. And so, um, And so this is basically what I've just covered is that you know, when you have a physical table, you get a physical table with a physical relationship. And when you generate a virtual table, you get this virtual table with this virtual one to many relationship. It behaves as if it's physically there in your model, but it's not physically there. And that's that's the reason it's it's such a powerful concept. Awesome. Okay. Um, the next question here is, uh, I, I'm going to try and paraphrase this, and this one uh, has sort of gone over a couple of things here, but uh, basically I, I think it kind of comes down to, uh, is it okay to use cumulative total of transactions to store balances? Uh, now, the official thing is a corkscrew pattern here, but this is basically the yeah. uh, opening balance plus period transactions gives you the closing. Next period, you got to start over again. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes. One thing to be aware of, however, and so if I, could, I don't know if I can just do a quick. So this is this is a, this is a financial um, balance sheet sort or um, GL thing, right? So yeah. the first transaction is one, and then we have another one, and then we have a three, and so and so the actual transaction values are one, 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 two, but what you're loading is this. Is that is that? Do I understand that correct, Ken? Could could be. Um, well, um, is it? So uh, the question was, is it okay to load? A, Cumulative values or something. Could you just read it out to well, me again? Make sure I, I guess. I guess. That, so the, uh, the the question uh, goes that normally in a spreadsheet you model stock balances by closing balance plus opening plus period transactions and then opening balance next period plus closing balance prior period. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This can't be done in DAX uh, or sorry, he says, but yeah, it can't can. be done in DAX. So cumulative total pattern means yes, closing can. balance in all periods. Yes, it can. Matt says. All right. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's more complex, um, and but it's certainly doable. I mean, if you, I mean, if, if I had a, let's say I had dates here, right? So first of January, and I'm a sh so if this was, a, a, and I can't give you a full answer here, but at, at least conceptually, and um, if today was the fifth of January, then I can extract the balance, which is give me the last value. Um, for today's date. This is assuming that there's only a single transaction or a single value for day. So I could work out what today's number is. I could then put a filter on this table using calculate and I say, I want you to filter this table, but exclude this one. So that would look something like equals, um, sorry, let me put my dog down again, equals filter the, uh, the data table. But before you do that, um, in fact, what I would probably have to do is like 
And then I'd say, give me the um, less than the maximum of the calendar days. And so this is the pattern that we would typically use. And so because this formula here is saying less than and not less than and equals to, basically what it does is it takes this table and excludes the last row. And instead, it gives me this table. And so once I've done that, I can get the last value again, which I know is five. So now I've got the current value 10, the previous value is five, and if I subtract them from each other, I can calculate that number here. So that's the basic pattern you can use. There's nothing, and I think the question was, is it okay to do that? Absolutely it is. Um, this column is likely to be more efficiently stored than this column. The reason is that it's all about the repeating numbers. The more repeating numbers, or stated differently, the less number of unique numbers in a column, the more efficient the, the storage is going to be. This one, by definition, has less, uh, sorry, more unique numbers. This column has less unique numbers. So you can see five unique numbers here, three unique numbers here. So therefore, the one on the left is going to be more efficient. But if your data is not in that format, you have to make a decision. Do I transform the data and load it this way, or do I load it this way and write more complex stacks? And it depends. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Hopefully that answered your, Henry, your question, Henry. He says uh, he appreciates the unique number information. Um, we're going to have to do a session at some point in time on power pivot efficiency or data model efficiency, I think, because uh, there's been a few yeah. questions on that. But, um, but yeah, awesome. I think that's it for the questions at this point. Okay. All right. Well, I've only got a small demo left. And, um, and so let's make sure I get the right. All right, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is the all function. So all is another table function. Um, you're getting the hang of this now. So <clears throat> the filter function is a table function that generates a virtual table. The all function is also a table function that generates a virtual table. But a ta the all function can also generate a new table with a different number of columns. And that's the demo that I'm going to show you. So I'll come back here to Power BI and I'm going to go back into DAX Studio. I don't know if I closed, it's opening another instance. That's okay. And so if I go evaluate here, so all DAX queries always start with um, the evaluate function, particularly when you're using an external tool like this. If you're doing a DAX query using the new table button, you don't have to use the evaluate function. All right, so I could write um, the simplest query I could write is say, give me all customers. Or oh, sorry, that not let me restate that. Give me the customers table. So this is the simplest DAX query you can write, and it just generates that table and, and puts it as the output. I could then say, give me all customers. And in this use case, the all function is actually removing any filters that might be passed to this function, typically from a visual. So it's done in runtime. And so in this instance, the all function is generating a copy of the customer's table, but it's removing any filters that exist. Now, when I run this query in DAX Studio, you can see that the query, and there's a whole lot of details here about DAX Studio, which I'm not going to go into, but this particular query was generated by the database. And in fact, it's returned. Um, I think these are two different queries, actually. So this is this is the query that I just ran, evaluate all customers, and it returns a table containing 18,484 rows. And in this case, that's exactly the same result as evaluate customers, also returned a table with 18,484 rows. But if you have a look at the physical table that's returned, look at how many columns have been returned. And so this this query went to the database and fetched all of the data about all of the customers. And that's a valid way to write that, but it's not the only way to write this formula because typically you would use this all function inside a filter in order to be able to uh, remove the filters from your visual. And so if I was to change this and say, give me all customer key, and I'll run this as a query, 
Notice now that my query returns a single column. I no longer have returned all of those extra columns of data. And if I'm using the all function inside a filter in order to be able to do some manipulation, then I don't want to load any data that I don't need. And it should be apparent to you that the level of granularity of this one is the same level of granularity as the entire customer's table. This works because the customer's table is a dimension table and therefore the customer key is at the same level of granularity as the entire table. And so when I write all customer key, I'm getting um, a more efficient execution through to the database because I'm only asking the database to return the data that I need for my calculation. Whereas when I say all customers, I'm telling the database to go away and bring the entire table back, even though technically I don't need it to do the job at hand. And so may maybe just a quick demo, if I wanted to work out um, you know, the percentage of customers, I might write a formula like this. So this measure might be um, total all customers. And I would typically write something like calculate uh, count rows of the customers. I'll, there's different ways you could write this of the customers table. And I could say, give me all customers. If I spell it right, it would work. So what I'm saying is that if I write that measure, it's going to give me the correct result. But um, effectively, it's, it's potentially not as efficient because I'm querying the entire table. Whereas if I did something like, um, I'm not actually sure if this is going to work, to be honest. Let's let's have a look. One thing I've learned about the DAX language is it can surprise you. So let's see. Okay, so it does work. And so see how by using all customer key, I, um, in actual fact, it's it's not working. Um, and so that's because of the, the filter coming here from this all occupation. But there's different ways of writing that. Uh, it's probably not a good example, but the, the key principle that I wanted to leave you with on this one is that there's a, um, a principle in the DAX language is that you should never filter a table if you can filter a column instead. And so what the all function does is it generates a virtual copy of the table with all the filters removed. But you can also use the all function to generate a brand new table that contains much um, or less columns. The minimum is one column but you can have as many columns as you want. And so you can build these more efficient, smaller runtime tables using one or more columns and the all function. And when you do that, so when you start using the all function with a column instead of a table, you will start to find that potentially your, your measures will improve in the overall performance. It's not always the case because um, one of the things about the DAX language is that the Microsoft developers are always improving the engine and that they learn how people write formulas and they can actually um, do substitution under the hood. So that if you write an inefficient formula, um, the engine will actually execute something more efficiently, even though you don't know that it's doing it. So it's not always the case that you'll get an improvement, but it's a good principle for you to learn. And so the all function is one of these virtual table functions but don't think of it as always creating a brand new replica of the original table. Consider using the individual columns that you need in order to make it more efficient. Okay, so I th that's it, Ken. So let me jump back and see whether there's any other questions. Yeah, I don't think any other ones have come in. It's just sort of uh, devolved into a, uh, a talk about monkey tools and DAX Studio at this point in time. Um, Okay. <laughs> I'm happy with any <laughs> off-topic questions as well, or um, you know, happy to ask me anything if if you like, or you know we can wrap it up. Uh, yeah, I mean, so the uh, the floor is open for questions, folks. If uh, if anybody has any, uh, you know, certainly uh, let us know here. Um, I'm not seeing anything firing into the chat at this point in time. Uh, hold Ron, your dog. This hold, you see, hold your dog. You up. See, this is Billy. <laughs> hey, hello, Billy. Uh, Billy doesn't want anything camera. to do with us. <laughs> What's the oh, advantage of the all functions? Um, 
Harlan, can you be more specific? Uh, I mean, all, the all functions are usually used to remove filters. So, um, you know, in the case of the, the demo that I had here, I, I didn't do a very good job here, but, um, you know, if I was to write this as say all occupation, and so this, basically, this is where I would normally use the all function. So, if I want to work out um, what's the percentage of clerical customers as a percentage of the total customer base, I need access to this number. I need to know what's the total across the entire customer database. Now, the reason I don't get 1844 here is because there's a filter on the customer occupation column. That's why I'm getting 2928 and not 1844. And so in this case, I'm using the all function to remove any filters that are coming from the occupation column. And that's good because there is a filter coming from the occupation column. So this is saying calculate before you do the count rows of the customers, go and remove any filters you find on the occupation column. And in that sense, I'm getting access to this total number. All right. And so this is the typical way that you would use the all function. It's to remove filters. And in fact, there's another function in the DAX language called remove filters. And this is actually syntax sugar. <clears throat> it basically, if you write remove filters from the occupation column, what actually gets executed under the hood is the all function. Anyway, this is just a, a well, I guess a syn syntax sugar version of the same formula. Okay, I want to I want to hear your take on this next one here, Matt. Uh, so, uh, if there was a progression of learning, you were doing this as a new data guy. What would you learn first? Excel formulas, VBA, M, DAX, SQL. If the goal is to be an amazing financial analyst or trainer like you, where would you oh, start? <laughs> you, you, you know the one about you know the the one about the Irishman who um, he's somewhere in Ireland and he's heading to Dublin and he asked the guy for directions. He said, "Hey, I'm." I'm heading to Dublin. Can you tell me where to go? He says, if you wanted to go to Dublin, you wouldn't start from here. And so, you know, this, but unfortunately, we're all where we are, right? So, um, okay, look, there's no one right answer to this. Um, I got to say that if, if I had my career over again and this product, Power BI, and it's, it's you know, it's the children, the DAX engine, Power Query, if these products were around 30 years ago, my career would definitely not have gone down the path that I, that I did. I would have been doing this much, much sooner. Um, I think, I mean, Power Query is a great standalone product. Anyone can learn that product at any time, even if you don't do data analytics and reporting. Power Query is one of the best products that most people don't know about. It's inside Excel and you can use it in traditional Excel um, from scratch. So I would always recommend do that at any time. Um, if you want to get into reporting and analytics, you have to understand the analysis services tabular engine. And so unfortunately, there's no good name for that um, subset of skills inside Power BI, but I, you know, it's, it's learning DAX basically. And so that's learning about you know, how to build a star schema, um, how to load it up, why do we do it this way, how to write those DAX formulas. So that's a whole journey in itself. Let's call that DAX data modeling. Um, when you come to build these star schemas, you need Power Query to do it for you. But the knowledge about what to do, how to structure it, well, that's actually a data modeling question. Um, the M language, which is a subset of Power Query, it's great to learn that, but it's not the first thing that I would learn. But um, particularly with Power Query Academy that um, that Ken and I have available through Skillwave, um, we do we do we teach you how to use the UI first, and then we build and teach you how to learn the M language um, as you want to get more and more advanced. VBA, look, there's still value in VBA, but I think a lot of the stuff that I used to use VBA for back in my day, you don't need to do it anymore because Power Query can do it for you. So. I would have VBA way down the track now, and and I doubt that that's as important. Um, not sure what other products that we were sort of talking about there. Uh, SQL, um, SQL, I 
taught myself SQL when I started down this journey. And that's because once I started to get into larger data sets, I got to the stage where Microsoft Access no longer met my data storage requirements. And um, SQL is pretty easy to learn. So I think you could do that at any time. One good way to learn SQL is to, I can't show you here, but when, when you do a Power Query query that connects to a SQL database, you can actually right click on the query and view the SQL code that's been generated under the hood. So it's a bit like um, using the VBA recorder to, to learn how to, to write SQL. I would say SQL is sort of on an as needed basis, VBA down the track. Excel formulas, um, look, to be honest, I hardly use Excel anymore. I know that's not the same with Ken, I mean, but Ken tends to be more of um, you know financial analytics and there's still absolutely a place for financial models and those sorts of things. And if you're doing those models, you definitely need to learn Excel formulas. Um, but uh, the DAX language is is almost fundamental if you want to be any good with Power BI. Because if you if you don't know DAX, then you're you're completely stuck, right? So if I say was just to build something like this, so product category. And let's say I go, uh, so uh, total sales. So total sales, let's say I don't know any DAX. Well, that's the extended amount column. Uh, total cost, let's say I don't know any DAX. So I can just bring that in. Total sales, total cost. But now how do I get total profit? To calculate total profit, I have to take total sales, subtract the cost to give me the profit. And I can't drag a column in to solve that problem. I must write my first piece of DAX. <clears throat> of course, I could do a quick measure like I showed you before that will write the DAX for you. And so that's one way to learn. But, you know, you're not going to be good at Power BI if you don't know DAX. <clears throat> so I think it's personal choice. I think anyone can learn Power Query at any time. I think it's good to learn DAX. Um, you can get quite a way in Power BI without learning DAX, but if you want to be good, you're going to have to learn something at some stage. Yeah, I'll give you my impression on this one too, actually just to, for the, the uh, compare and contrast and similarities on this. To me, if I were teaching someone to actually go through, even though I do a lot of work in Excel today, uh, I it shocked me five years ago, I heard about a statistic of how many workbooks had no formulas in them. And I thought, how could you ever do that? And today, the majority of the workbooks that I write have no Excel formulas in them. They are DAX formulas. That's where it goes. So for me, uh, my sort of thing is you learn Power Query first, not M. You learn Power Query and how to use it through the user interface. Uh, from there, you need to learn dimensional modeling, how to organize those star schemas and, and whatnot. After that, you need to learn DAX. You can get a little ways with your implicit measures, but to get really good, you want to learn your, your DAX measures and whatnot. Uh, VBA is way down the track for me uh, today. I love VBA. It's what got me hooked on Excel, but it's the last thing that uh, I would learn next to only SQL. And the reason being is because Power Query writes my SQL for me. Um, you know, every language and every component and every facet that you learn on this just makes you a little bit more powerful and a little bit more robust. But at the end of the day, it's Power Query to reshape your data first, learn how to model it second, learn how to DAX it third. And after that, you're going to be going a long way on this whole thing. So uh, that's the route that I would go. Um, I see a couple of questions there. So Ron's yep. talking about why is MK sensitive? <laughs> Cheer, that's a good question. And if I could find that person, I would be lining them up and um, we'd be taking in turns and having a swipe at them. So yeah, I, yep. I think it's the pits too. So, um, but it is what it is. So um, don't it's see any good changing. reason for it. No, it's not going to change. So uh, where's the underlying storage in Power BI? Local machine RAM. Okay, so it's stored on disk. So when you save your PBIX file, it's stored on disk. When you open the PBIX file, an instance of SQL Server Analysis Services tabula is spawned on your computer, and then that that reads from disk and holds it in RAM memory. And so, if you've got a you know simplistic example, if you don't have enough RAM memory to load your model, it will not work. So it must have you must have enough spare RAM memory, and it doesn't cache it to disk. It may cache it to disk if you so here's the thing, right? You can take a two gigabyte source file, load it and model it well into Power BI and get it down to 100 megabytes because it compresses 10 to 20 times. Depends if you do a good job or not. But conceptually, you can get a two gigabyte source file, 
loader into Power BI for 100 megabytes. And you can do calculations in its compressed format. But imagine if you had to decompress that file in order to do a calculation. Then your 100 meg has to materialize into two gigabytes before I can do the calculation. And that, if that happens to you, you'll hear the fan in your computer start to fire up as the uh, as the uh, the engine is starting to materialize that table in memory and then start caching it on disk. And, and that's when a lot of people get um, get in trouble. So that's how it works on your desktop using Power BI Desktop. Once you publish it to powerbi.com, it's stored on disk in the cloud, but um, it will stay hot in the cloud, so it will stay in memory. But if you're not accessing the report for a period of time, it will get removed from RAM stored on disk. If you come back a week later and open up that report, it'll do a basically a, a warm um, load into RAM and start going from there. So hopefully that answers that. All right. Um... Uh, we got a question on how how we should uh, how we you would suggest taking the courses on SkillWave. Um, I, I would. Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, we've been talking um, about doing a bit of a, a learning path, um, but it's every time we look at it, it's hard, right? Well, it's yeah, it's very hard because I mean, it, uh, so much of it depends on what your need is, right? I mean, if you have really lousy data, you don't really want to start with the Power Query Academy. If you're if you're in a scenario where you're trying to uh, to get up to speed with all all things and trying to get the you know uh, an introduction to a lot of different pieces, I mean the self service BI bootcamp is great. If you're looking at really mastering your DAX game, that supercharged Power BI online courses, you know you just can't beat it, right? So it really depends on sort of what what components you're actually going after and where you actually. Uh, where you need to be. So, speaking of um, speaking of this stuff as well, um, Matt, you're uh, you actually do have a course at Skillwave, uh, Supercharged Power BI Online, where you teach DAX. Um, I think yeah. uh, people should know about that. I mean, and I know you're you're carefully not mentioning it, but I'm going to because um, you know it's uh, it's a fantastic resource. So, uh, if you can just pull that up since you're right there, that would yeah. be great. I've actually um, got two courses, and I just perhaps to um, highlight the difference. So this one here, Supercharged Power BI. This this course basically uses my book. So my book, I, I've honed that book three times over the last six years, and it's a very targeted learning resource. And so this Supercharged Power BI, basically you read the book, I support the chapters with video content, video on demand, and then there's a weekly live Q&A where you come and we talk about your problems, the things that you don't understand, we do that five times over a cycle, um, and so that's that's a good way of learning. But you're going to be, it's going to be self-paced learning. You have to do the work in my book and the practice exercises to get the learning. But it's the most in-depth DAX course that's currently online. Um, then I have these other two courses, and these two are actually video-on-demand versions of my live training course. So we do live training, two-day live training course. This is day one and this is day two, and it's literally a video recording of that course. I sell that live course for $1,200 um, for the two courses. So it's actually excellent value. I can't remember. I think I charge $170 for each of those. Um, but it's uh, there's no live interaction and Q&A and so on. So they're the courses. And um, see this space here, this space will be filled with a new course, hopefully in seven to 10 days from now. So I, I will have a more advanced DAX course coming uh, anytime soon. Fantastic. Um, all right, you know what? I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, I see a comment from, from Faraz. Hi, Faraz. Good to see you, thanks <laughs> um, for joining. And Stanton, they, uh, Stanton from Skillwave as well. Yeah, and there's a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, great session comments and good stuff and and whatnot. Um, so I'm thinking that if there are no other questions in on this one, um, mm -hmm. it's probably a good time to to close her off for the night. So uh, Matt, a huge thanks again for coming and doing this. I always love oh, nice. uh, love watching you present on DAX and. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for coming. We'll get the video of this posted up within the next 48 hours onto uh, my YouTube channel and we'll post on the Meetup site when it's there. Uh, I'm sure that we'll have comments coming in looking for it within the next three minutes because we always do, but uh, it will definitely be uh, showing up in the next little while. So thanks again, bud. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks, guys. We'll, uh, thanks for the opportunity. We'll catch you next time. All yeah, right. Bye. Cheers.